I'm I'm really excited to be able to introduce uh, one of my favourite of Bunuel's films, uh, one of his most fascinating films, I think. Um, so as you might know, this film um, it was directed in 1972 in France. It's Bunuel's penultimate film. He actually intended it to be his last film, but he actually went on to make another final film uh, in 1977, yeah. uh, Obscure Object of Desire. And so um, Bunuel at this stage in his career, he's 72. So as you know, he was born in 1900. He's getting a bit doddery. He's getting a bit deaf. Um, and as you know, uh, Bunuel, um, born in Spain um, from a deeply Catholic, uh, very, very bourgeois upbringing in Aragon. But despite being Spanish, um, he would spent most of his life outside of Spain much in the same same way that Pablo Picasso did. So he very much is a kind of like outsider to the societies that he depicts in his films. And as you know, he's a, you know, a central figure of many film industries. We know that he was integral to uh, French surrealism in Paris in the 1920s, where he collaborated with Dali. We know that in the 1930s, uh, he was enlisted to make propaganda films for the Republican side in the Spanish Civil War. Then um, with uh, the installation of the Franco regime in 1939, which obviously he did not agree with, um, he goes into self-imposed exile and starts to make uh, brilliant films, which I'm sure many of you have seen in the Mexico studio system. Now, um, this takes us from the 40s to the 1950s to the 1960s, which is his kind of later period of filmmaking, which is most uh, of all associated with France uh, and his collaboration with the producer Serge Silberman. And the two of them worked together from uh, 1964 onwards, beginning with Diary of a Chambermaid. And so, as you'll see um, in this film, it has all of the kind of hallmarks of Bunuel's filmmaking from the 1940s onwards. So extremely unfussy, extremely kind of economical. Um, so we know that Bunuel shot his films quite quickly uh, in a series of, you know, just a few weeks. Uh, and he very rarely improvised or deviated from the script. And he just wanted to make a, as little fuss as possible, particularly in the editing process. Uh, and Bunuel preferred to work with actors and collaborators that he knew um, and he was known for offering them very very little direction um, so very very little instruction to his actors so he would just say move left move right and so on but it's the simplicity and its ordinariness of his style uh, that I want you to think about because I think it kind of lulls the spectator into a kind of false sense of security and often held in kind of bizarre tension with a narrative that it often has very, very strange, uh, increasingly irrational uh, events. And we know that this strangeness, of course, owes itself to his uh, training, his, his early years in surrealism, uh, and this surrealism can be seen throughout the whole of his career, you know, from the 1920s to the 1970s. And we know that surrealism was all about exploring the unconscious mind, uh, exploring the unknown part of the human self, that part of ourselves that can only truly be, be accessed um, when we're sleeping. And so dreams are very, very important to his work. And, you know, he found film was the perfect artistic medium with which to convey the experience of dream. You know, and he also found that the experience of watching cinema um, in a darkened room was almost like falling into a dreamlike state. So as well as his dreams, um, his work is informed by his bourgeois and his Catholic upbringing. So... Um, many of the themes of his uh, films explore sexual repression, they explore uh, the theme of uh, bourgeois morality. They're also known for their caustic black humour 
and their kind of transgressive eroticism and f- fetishism. So kind of moving closer to the film, the discrete charm of the bourgeoisie, well, its plot um, is very simple. And this isn't a spoiler, um, just quite simply, six um, upper middle class friends or acquaintances uh, arrive for dinner, but inexplicably they find themselves unable to eat. Um, So something is always preventing them from eating. So one of the key themes of this film is frustration. Um, So the act of eating um, and therefore the act of pleasure, or rather pleasure itself, is one that is constantly delayed, constantly deferred. Um, And so (laughs) for this reason, one critic actually referred to the film as Coetus Interruptus when it came out in 1972. The the narrative is famously um, interspersed with a number of dream sequences and some of these were actually um, inspired by Buñuel's own dreams. Yet what is striking about these dream sequences is how the film switches seamlessly between reality and dream and then from reality, sorry, reality to dream and then from dream back to reality again, kind of almost imperceptibly. So it, the film is basically bonkers, um, but its craziness is grounded in a, a norm- normality, a kind of almost banality, which is really quite striking, I find. So as I mentioned, 1972, um, a little bit about the broader social context. Well, um, we know that the early 1970s, social unrest is at its height in Europe. And there are allusions in the film, in the script, made to Vietnam, to Mao, to women's lib, to terrorism, to drug trafficking. So these are all kind of like contemporary issues at the time. So the film really kind of touches on the zeitgeist of the era. And bear in mind that the May 1968 riots had only taken place four years previously to this film. So within this context of the early 1970s, um, attacking the bourgeoisie um, was a very fashionable thing to do in European cinema, so much so that it almost become a bit of a trope at this point. Now, one of the great pleasures of this film is the stars, the actors, uh, and you'll see actors that have previously starred in Buñuel's films, such as Fernando Rey, um, a, a very, very celebrated Spanish actor, Michel Piccoli also. But there are also newcomers in this film, um, newcomers to his cinema, such as Stéphane Audran, who was a fabulously elegant uh, French actress with incredible uh, cheekbones. Uh, she was married to Claude Chabrol during this period, and Chabrol, also another director who was obsessed with the bourgeoisie, and his films constantly skewered the mores and the rituals of the bourgeoisie in the same way that Buñuel does in this film. Now, um, the discrete charm of the bourgeoisie was Buñuel's most successful film, um, not just critically, but also commercially. Um, It won the Oscar for the best foreign film, something that would be inconceivable today given how conventional and slightly conservative the tastes are of the Oscars. Um, Buñuel famously um, thought that uh, award ceremonies were a load of rubbish so he therefore turned up to accept his award wearing a comedy wig and fake glasses. So I really really hope you enjoy the film as much as I enjoy it. Um, As you may have gathered there is no real sense of continuous plot it's not kind of linear narrative because of the constant interruptions and disruptions so my advice to you is to just lose yourself lose yourself in the strangeness of the film and allow yourself to be captivated by its visual surface allow yourself to be captivated by the charm and the glamour of uh, the actors. Okay, thank you very much.